Hi everyone. Good day to you, wherever you are. And I welcome you to the finest music drama channel. Sharing the love, of finest literature. Just, lie down on an easy chair. Throw your cares off your mind. Think of nothing, but the temperature of your drink. I hope, you will enjoy today's dramatization. Your comments are much appreciated. Please support the love, of finest literature, by subscribing and sharing the channel with friends, to get updated on future releases. You see, my dear Lieutenant, I understand your disappointment perfectly. You have been told, in error, that I am an intelligent man, who in the course of his career has solved a certain number of criminal problems. <laughs> my friend O'Brien, who is fond of irony, must have exaggerated a little. Now, in the first place, I am not intelligent. It was funny to see the lieutenant as vexed as if someone were making fun of him, when Megray had never been more sincere. In the second place, I try never to form an idea about a case before it's closed. Are you married? Of course, replied Lewis, disconcerted by such a bizarre question. Uh, for years now, no doubt. And I'm sure you're convinced that your wife does not always understand you. And your wife, for her part, has the same conviction about you. Yet. You live together, you spend evenings together, you sleep in the same bed, you have children. Two weeks ago, I had never heard of Jean, Mora, or little John. Four days ago, I did not even know that Joss McGill existed. And it was only yesterday, in the home of a helpless old gentleman, that a medium spoke to me about a certain Jesse. Uh, and you'd like me to have a definite idea about each other? I am at sea, Lieutenant. For Maigret, though, being at sea is only the prelude to making landfall in just the right place, something that happens only when he fully understands the people involved. In one of these novels, Simonon writes this about that mysterious process. By the time all the characters had taken on the same human roundness, when he could feel them, the mystery would be very close to being solved. Maigret hesitates. Bouvier, it's Meg Ray here. Are you busy at the moment? Never too busy to speak to you. I'd like some information. Uh, confidential, of course. Just between the two of us, that's right. Do you know a colleague of yours called Emile Parandon? Uh, what in heaven's name can the judicial police have against Parandon? I don't know. Probably nothing. That's most likely. I haven't met Parandon more than a dozen times in my life... He hardly sets foot in court, and then only for civil cases. How old is he? Oh, no age. He might just as easily be 40 as 50. Uh, Huguette, uh, look up Parandon's date of birth in the Bar Society yearbook. Emile. Oh, there's only one anyway. Uh, you must have heard of his father, who's still alive, or... If he's dead, it's only recently. Professor Parenton, the surgeon at Linec, huh. uh, a member of the Academy of Medicine, of the Academy of Ethical and Political Sciences, etc., etc. A character. When I see you next, I'll tell you all about him. He came to Paris very young, with the hay still sticking out of his ears. He was short and stocky and looked like a bull. And he didn't just look like one. Yes. Uh, what about his son? Oh, well, he's a jurist, really. He specializes in international law, particularly in marine law. 
Uh, they say he's unbeatable there. People come from all over the world to consult him, and he's often asked to arbitrate in uh, delicate cases where big business interests are at stake. What, what uh, kind of a man is he? Oh, small, gnome-like. <laughs> Uh, malicious people might say positively simian. Is he married? Uh, th thank you, Huguet. Uh, there. Uh, oh, I have his age here. Hmm. Uh, 46. Uh, is he married? Oh, he certainly is married. Uh, very well married, too. He married one of the daughters of Gassin de Beaulieu. You remember him. He was one of the most ferocious prosecutors at the time of the liberation. Then he was appointed first president of the Supreme Court of Appeal. By now, he must have retired to his chateau in the Vendée. The family is very rich. As a matter of fact, Parenton practices from the old man's former apartment. Oh, where? Oh, Avenue Marigny. An apartment house built to defy time with apartments more like state reception rooms than to live in. I uh, know. Huge ceilings, marble fireplaces. Exactly. Do you know anything else? <laughs> what else would I know? I've never had to defend them in court. Well, thanks very much, Maître Bouvier. Oh, you can do the same for me sometime. So, uh, you don't think it's a deranged person, Patron? No, the point. I don't think it's a deranged person. No specific threat. A sense of hopeless distress. Also, the envelopes of good quality. But the expensive paper and the postmark, it was much too easy to trace. Well, precisely. It's as if someone wanted to lead me to Metro Perondon. And the language of the anonymous letter is so precise, which is rare in these cases. Oh, listen... Dear Divisional Chief Inspector, I do not know you personally, but what I have read of your investigations and of your attitude to criminals gives me confidence. This letter will astonish you. Do not throw it into the waste paper basket too quickly. It is not a joke, nor is it the work of a maniac. You know better than I do that the truth is not always credible. A murder will be committed shortly, certainly within a few days, perhaps by someone known to me, perhaps by me myself, I am not writing to you so that the murder will not take place. It is, in a way, inevitable. But when it happens, I would like you to know. If you take me seriously, please put the following advertisement in the personal column of Le Figaro or Le Monde. K.R. I am waiting for a second letter. I do not know if I shall write it. I am very worried. Certain decisions are hard to make. I may perhaps see you one day in your office, but then we shall be on opposite sides of the fence... Yours faithfully. By the feel of the paper, it could be mine. It's not easy to come by. The last time my engraver had to order it from the manufacturer. Mm, that's exactly what brought me here, Maître Perondon. And my engraved letterhead was carefully cut off. A murder will be committed shortly, perhaps by someone known to me, perhaps by myself. Hmm. <laughs> Looks as if each word had been carefully chosen, don't you think? That's the impression I got from the letter. It is, in a way, inevitable. And I don't like that sentence too much. There's something gratuitous about it, strange. One detail struck me. The person who wrote this letter does not address me as chief inspector, as most people do, but by my official title, divisional chief inspector. Yes, I thought of that too. Have you placed the advertisement? It'll appear in Le Monde this evening and in uh, tomorrow morning's Figaro. Eh, well, what may I offer you? The cognac isn't particularly good, but I have a 40-year-old Armagnac. Oh, just a little, please. <laughs> My wife only lets me have a drop on special occasions. She says I have a weak liver. According to her, I'm weak all over, and I haven't a single healthy organ in me. <laughs> <laughs> Monsieur, may I ask you a rather personal question? Hmm? How old were you when you began to understand men? Oh, I don't know. I, I'm not sure that I do understand them. Oh, yes, you do. And they know it very well. That's one of the reasons why they're almost relieved to confess. It's the same with my colleagues. I could prove the contrary, but that would only bore you. You studied medicine, didn't you? Mm, only for two years. If what I've read is true, your father died, and since you were unable to continue your studies, you joined the police. Mm -hmm. 
If I've been asking these personal questions, it's because I'm passionately interested in Article 64 of the Penal Code, which you must know better than I do. If the person charged with the commission of a felony or misdemeanor was then insane or acted by absolute necessity, no offense has been committed. Hmm? What do you think of it? Oh, I'm glad I'm not a judge. This way, I don't have to pass judgment. Yeah, that's the kind of thought I'd like to hear you say. This is the sort of thing I want to know. Sitting in your office in front of a guilty man, or a man who is presumed guilty, are you capable of determining to what extent he is responsible? Rarely. The psychiatrists afterwards... Yeah, my they... library is full of psychiatrists. The older generation, for the most part, answered responsible and went on their way with a clear conscience. But the more contemporary ones... Mm, I know. Do you speak English? Well, very badly. Do you know what they mean by a hobby? Yes. Well, my dear Monsieur Magre, my hobby, my mania, as some people say, is Article 64. And I'm not the only one. And that famous article isn't found only in the French Penal Code. In more or less identical terms, it is found in the United States, in England, in Germany, and in Italy. There are thousands of us all over the world, no, tens of thousands, who have made it our goal to change this shameful Article 64, which is a relic of the past. It's not a secret society. There are official organizations in most countries with their magazines, their journals. Do you know the answer they give us? They tell us... The penal code is an integrated whole. If you tamper with one stone, the whole edifice runs the risk of collapsing. If one followed your wishes, the doctor and not the judge would have the task of judging. Come in, my dear. Let me introduce Chief Inspector Megre. The woman is about 40, elegant, very vivacious, with extremely restless eyes. And it takes her only a few seconds to examine me from head to toe. She doubtless will have noticed if I have a tiny speck of mud on my left shoe. How do you do, Chief Inspector? I hope you haven't come to arrest my husband. With his poor health, you'd have to put him in the prison infirmary. I expect it's about one of our domestics. Well, I've had no complaint about any of them. But well, that'd be a matter for the local police. Uh, what do you think of our armagnac? I hope you only had a drop, darling. Mm. Uh, well, gentlemen, I'll uh, leave you to your own affairs. I was going to tell you that I won't be back before eight, darling. You can always join me at Hortense's after seven, if you mm -hmm. like. Uh, goodbye, Monsieur Maigret. Uh -huh. I'm so happy to have met you. You're an extremely interesting man. Did you get that? Pardon? You're an extremely interesting man. Oh. <laughs> She's furious that you didn't say anything to her. Nothing would have given her greater pleasure than for you to have taken her for my daughter. Uh, you have a daughter? Yes, she's 18. She's at the Sorbonne, taking some classes in archaeology. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how long that will last. Last year, she wanted to be a chemist. I have a son, too, Jacques. He's 15 in the tertiary at the Lycée Racine. We ought to get back to your letter. Here's a sheet of my writing paper. Your experts will tell you if it's really the same paper, but I'm almost certain that it is. I'd better ring for her. Yes, maître. Mademoiselle Vague, would you be so good as to bring me one of the envelopes we use for the tradesmen? You see, Chief Inspector, we pay our tradespeople by check at the end of the month. It would be pretentious to use our engraved envelopes to pay their bills, so we have ordinary white envelopes. Here it is. Thank you. Uh, you can compare this, too. If the envelope and the paper are both the same, you can be almost certain that the letter came from here. Can you think of any reason that might have prompted someone to write this letter? Reason? <laughs> I wasn't expecting that word, Monsieur Maigret. I realize you must ask the question, but why reason? Undoubtedly, everyone has some, consciously or not. Do many people live in this apartment? Living in? Oh, not many. My wife and I, of course. Do you sleep in separate bedrooms? How did you guess? Oh, I don't know. I asked the question without thinking. Well, it is quite true. We do sleep in separate rooms. My wife likes to go to bed late and stay in bed in the mornings, and I'm an early bird. In any case, you're free to go through all the rooms whenever you like. I may as well say at once that I did not choose the apartment, nor did I have anything to do with furnishing it. So I'm not quite in my own home, but rather in my wife's, or better still, in my father-in-law's. 
And only the books and the furniture in my bedroom and this study are my own things. Your father is still alive, isn't he? He lives almost opposite on the Rue de Mermesnil, in an apartment he furnished for his retirement. He's been a widower for 30 years. He was a surgeon. A famous surgeon. Yes. You knew that, too. Mm. But then you must know that his passion was not Article 64, but women. I've already told you about my daughter Paul and her brother Jacques. If you want to get on well with her, you'd better know that my daughter calls herself Bambi and insists on calling her brother Gus. I shall let everyone know that you are to have the freedom of the apartment and to answer all your questions truthfully. I should probably come tomorrow, sometime in the morning, but I shan't disturb you. Well, in that case, I shall disturb you. There it is, patron. The same envelope, the same carefully written block letters, the same writing paper with the letterhead cut off. But the tone has changed. You made a mistake, Monsieur Maigret, in coming before receiving my second letter. Now they all have a B in their bonnet, and that means things will be speeded up. From now on, the crime may be committed at any moment, and that will be partly your fault. I thought you were more patient, more reflective. Do you really think that you are capable of discovering the secrets of a whole household in one afternoon? You are more credulous and perhaps more vain than I had thought. I cannot help you any more. My only advice to you is to continue your investigation without believing what anyone tells you. With regards, in spite of everything, I retain my admiration for you. And don't you think it's a kid having fun? That's what my wife said last night. But what do you think, Patron? No. No, I don't think it's a joke in poor taste. And besides, the idea did not occur to Metro Penando either. True, it's a well-ordered household. The butler received me with calm dignity. The secretary... With the funny name, is lively and pleasant. And as for Mr. Perondo, he's shown himself to be a most charming host, in spite of his uh, strange gnome-like appearance. But, Le Point, in spite of all this, there was an undercurrent of unhappiness. The secretary's name, according to your notes, is Mademoiselle Vague. Mademoiselle Vague. Yeah, that's it. She works in a small room with green-painted filing cabinets around the walls, and she has the latest model electric typewriter. Did you want to see me, Chief Inspector? I'm sorry I haven't got an armchair for you. If you'd rather, we could go to the library. Oh, I'd prefer to stay here. Mm. The Rolls Royce out there in the courtyard that the chauffeur is washing, does that belong to Metro Perondon? No, to the tenants on the second floor. They're Peruvians. Does Maître Perrandon have a chauffeur? He has to, because his eyesight is too poor to let him drive. What kind of a car does he have? A Cadillac. Madame uses it more often than he does. Hmm. Do you know why I'm here? I know that we're all at your service, and that we are to answer all your questions, even if we think they're indiscreet. Did you see the letter? I saw a photocopy. What do you think of it? What does Maître Perrandon think of it? <laughs> Same as you do. What do you mean? That he was no more surprised than you are. Should I have reacted in any special way? When someone announces that a murder is going to be committed in a house... Well, that could happen in any house, couldn't it? Well, up to the moment when a man commits a crime, I expect that he acts like any other man. Well, that he's like any other man. Otherwise... Otherwise, we would arrest future criminals in advance. Hmm. That's true enough. I put the requested advertisement in. This morning, I had a second letter. Read it. Hmm. Oh, I'm beginning to understand. Is, um, is uh, Perendon's boy a practical joker? Gus? He's quite the opposite. He's intelligent, but reserved. He's always at the top of his class at the lycée, though he never does any work. What's he most interested in? Music and electronics. He's built a complete stereo system in his bedroom, and he subscribes to, oh, I don't know how many scientific magazines. Has he any friends? Sometimes a friend comes to listen to records or, or do experiments with him. How does he get on with his father? Gus admires his father, but, well, he admires him from a distance without letting him see it and with a kind of humility. Well, you see, well, to understand them, you'd have to know the whole family and your investigations would have to go on forever. Mm -hmm. You know, this apartment belonged to Monsieur Gasson de Beaulieu and it's full of reminders of him. Well, he's been ill for three years and never leaves his chateau in the Vendée. But before that, he sometimes came to spend a week or two here. He still has a room. And from the moment he came in, 
He was master of the house again. Uh, Mr. Perrinot's father, the surgeon, does he still come? Not very often. You'll have heard the stories about him. Everyone has. A few years ago, he was still a force of nature. And since he lives very near here, he often used to drop in for a visit. And the children adored him. That didn't please everyone. Mm, particularly Madame Perrinot. Oh, there was no love lost between them. I don't know anything for sure. The servants have talked about a violent scene between them. At any rate, he doesn't come anymore, but Mette Pandon goes to visit him every two or three days. So the Gassins have beaten the uh, Pandon, in fact, huh? More than you think. I'm going to ask you an indiscreet question. Do you go to bed with Monsieur Pandon? In a sense, yes. We make love, but it's always on the run, so to speak, so the word... Bed isn't appropriate since we've never been in bed together. Do the others know? They must guess. Why? Well, when you know the apartment better, you'll understand. Let's see. How many people are around here during the day? Monsieur and Madame Pandon and the two children, that's four. René Tortue, Maître Pandon's assistant, and Julien, the office boy, and myself. That's three in the office, makes seven. Fernandon the butler, the cook Madame Vaucan, the maid Lise who sleeps in the apartment, and there's Madame Marchand who comes in daily to do the cleaning. That brings us to eleven. Not to mention Madame's Monsieur who comes four mornings a week, or any of her three sister, or her friends. Well, mm. even though there are a lot of rooms, one meets everyone else, especially in here. Oh. Why in here especially? Because it's here everyone comes to get paper, stamps, paper clips. If Gus needs a piece of string, it's these drawers he comes to look in. Bambi always needs stamps or scotch tape. As for Madame, she is everywhere. Oh, yes, she goes out a lot, but one never knows if she's out or in. You'll have noticed that all the halls and most of the rooms are carpeted. You can't hear anyone coming. The door opens, and in pops someone you weren't expecting. Has she ever surprised you with her husband? I'm not sure. Once, well, not long before Christmas, when we thought she was at the hairdresser's, she came in at a rather delicate moment. We had time to look normal. At least I think we did. I, I'm not sure. She seemed very natural and began to talk to her husband about the present she just bought for Gus. Has she changed her attitude to you? No. She's nice to everyone. A kind of niceness that is peculiarly her own, a little as if she were floating around above us to protect us. I secretly nicknamed her the Angel. Don't you like her? I wouldn't have her for a friend, if that's what you mean. Have you noticed that thin cut on the surface of your desk, still fresh? Such as your sharp erasing knife would have made, cutting a sheet of paper? So you noticed the scratch, too. Isn't it awful to spoil such a lovely Have you table? any idea who did it? Anyone with access to this room. Well, that's to say, anyone at all. I told you, everybody treats this room as his own. Hmm. How does uh, Bambi get on with her mother? Badly. Do they quarrel? Oh, not even that. They hardly speak to each other. On whose side is the uh, animosity? On Bambi's. Oh, you'll be seeing her. Although she's young, she passes judgment on everyone around her. And you can tell by her look that she's judging them cruelly. Unjustly? Not always. Do you think that she knows about your relationship with her father? I've sometimes wondered about that. I don't know. Anyone could have looked in on us without our knowing... Does she love her father? She's taken him under her protection. She seems to think of him as her mother's victim, and that's why she hates her for taking so much of the limelight. In fact, Monsieur Perrondon doesn't play uh, an important role in the family, does he? Not an obvious role. Has he never tried? But perhaps he did a long time ago. He must have seen that the battle was already lost, and... He retreated into his shell. <laughs> oh, not as much as you may think... He knows everything that goes on, too. He doesn't ask questions like Madame Pardon. He contents himself with listening, observing, deducing. He's an extremely intelligent man. Mm, I had that impression. Are you going to tell him what we were talking about? Yes. Even about your relationship with him? Of course. One question that you will find ridiculous, mademoiselle. Has the Pardon boy... Everybody calls him Gus. Right. Has uh, Gus ever tried to make love to you? He's 15 years old. I know. That's just the age to be curious about certain things or for sentimental attachments or passionate jealousies. No! Oh, when I first knew him five years ago, 
He was a little boy who came in to ask me for stamps for his collection. A boy who scrounged incredible amounts of pencils and scotch tape. And sometimes he asked me to help him with his homework. He would sit where you are and watch me with a serious expression. And now? He's half a head taller than I am, and he's been shaving for a year. If he scrounges anything from me now, it's cigarettes. Aren't his visits any more frequent? Quite the opposite. He leads his own life, apart from the family, except for meals. And he even refuses to appear at table when there are guests. He prefers to eat in the kitchen. Is he ashamed of living in a house like this? It's a bit like that. Who, in your opinion, is the person who is being threatened? Why won't you answer? Because you know perfectly well what I would say. Maître Pendant. Hmm. Oh, thank you. I think I've tormented you enough this morning. I'll probably come back to see you again. Do you want to question the others? Mm, not before lunch. It's almost noon. I expect I'll see them after. Are there not thousands and thousands of potential murderers in Paris? Why has this one felt it necessary to warn me in advance? Through a kind of romanticism? To make himself interesting? Or does he want to be stopped before he does anything? How can he be stopped? I feel like shrugging my shoulders, jumping on the first open bus that comes along and going back to the key to hell with the parenton. Back there, I might find some poor devil who was really killed because for him, that's the only way out. Or perhaps a young tough from Pigalle, newly arrived from Marseille, or Bastia, who has done in a rival to prove he's a man. Chief Inspector Magre, give me my inspector's room. Oh, La Pointe, anything new? Uh, a phone call from Madame Paranda, Patron. She wanted to speak to you yourself. I had a terrible time getting her to understand that you have lunch just like anyone else. What does she want? She wants you to go and see her as soon as possible. At home? Yes. She'll wait for you until four o'clock. She has an important appointment after that. With her hairdresser, no doubt. Is that all? No, but the other might be a joke. Half an hour ago, the switchboard had someone on the line. A man or a woman, she couldn't tell which. An odd voice. Or it might have been a child's. Anyway, the person was breathing hard in a hurry or upset and said very quickly, tell Chief Inspector Maigret to hurry. The switchboard had no time to ask anything. The person had already hung up. It isn't a letter this time, and that's why I'm asking myself. Don't ask yourself anything. I'm not asking myself any questions. I'm not trying to play guessing games. But that doesn't stop me from being worried. Well, thank you, LaPointe. I'm going back to see what Madame wants. If anything comes up, you can call me there. I'm a little ashamed, Chief Inspector, of having telephoned you. Or rather, of having telephoned... Everything is blue. The silk brocade covering the walls, the Louis XV armchairs, the upholstery. Even the yellow patterned Chinese rug has a blue background. Forgive me for is it by chance that at two in the night, afternoon she's still wearing a house coat? An elegant turquoise blue house coat? Uh, do sit down. I'm a little jealous of the fact that you went to see the little bog girl before you came to see me this morning. Oh, I shouldn't have dared to disturb you so early. Well, no doubt you've been told that I get up late and that I keep to my rooms until midday. It is true, and it isn't. I lead a very busy life, Monsieur Maigret. And in fact, I start my days early. First of all, there was this big house to run. If I didn't telephone to the stores myself, I, I don't know what we should eat nor what kind of bills we should get at the end of the month. Madame Vaucan is an excellent cook, but the telephone still makes her stammer. The children take up my time. Even though they are grown up now, I have to take an interest in their clothes, their activities. <laughs> well, if it weren't for me, Gus would live in jeans, a sweater, and sneakers all year round. Oh, it doesn't matter. I, I won't mention the charity work I'm involved in. Other people are content to send a check or attend a cocktail party, but when it's a question of real work, you won't find any work. <laughs> I uh, imagine you lead a very busy life, too. Well, you understand, madame. I'm only a civil servant. 
<laughs> I must tell that to Jacqueline. <laughs> She's the wife of the Minister of the Interior, one of my best friends. Hmm. I may appear to be joking. Well, I am joking. But you must realize that that is only a front. In fact, Monsieur Maigret, I am tormented by what is happening. More than tormented. What did you think of my husband? Oh, he's very pleasant. Of course. That's what everyone says. I mean... He's very intelligent, remarkably intelligent. I think that he's very sensitive, too. If you are being quite honest, wouldn't you say he's oversensitive? Sometimes he frightens me, he's so introspective. He's a man who suffers, I've always known that. When I married him, there was a certain amount of pity in my love for him. Oh? Why? But you have seen him. Right from childhood, he must have been ashamed of his looks. He isn't tall. Many other oh, men... Oh, look, and... Chief Inspector, let us lay our cards on the table. I don't know what his heredity is, or rather I know only too well. His mother was a young nurse at Lineck, a, a ward maid, really. And she was only 16 when Professor Parandon got her with child. Now, why on earth, since he was a surgeon, didn't he do an abortion? Did she threaten to expose him? I don't know. What I do know is that Emile was a seven-month's baby. That is, a premature baby. Most premature babies grow into normal children. Do you think he is normal? Uh, excuse me if uh, I let don't... Let me finish, uh... please. Tomorrow, the next day, Sunday, you will perhaps be called here and you will find yourself in front of a dead woman who will be me. I forgive him in advance because I know he is not responsible and that medicine, in spite of all its progress... Do you consider your husband to be a medical case? Yes. A mental case? Perhaps. Have you consulted any doctors? Yes. Doctors who know him? We have several doctors among our friends. Well, what exactly have they told you? To take care... To take care of what? We haven't gone into details. They were not consultations, but social conversations. Are they all of the same opinion? Several of them are. Can you give me their names? Well, it wouldn't be right to give you their names, but if you want to have them examined by an expert... When you telephoned my office to ask me to come to see you, did you already have that in mind? Have what in mind? To ask me more or less directly to have your husband examined by a psychiatrist? Did I say that? That is a word I never even mentioned. But the thought showed clearly behind everything you said. In that case, either you have misunderstood me or I have expressed myself badly. What I said to you, what I am repeating now, is that I am afraid. That there is fear running loose in this house. And I am repeating to you. Fear of what? I thought you would understand without my having to go into details. I I'm afraid for myself, for him. In other words, you're afraid that he may kill you? Or that he may commit suicide? Put that way, it seems ridiculous, I know, when everything around us is so peaceful. Forgive me if I seem indiscreet. Uh, does your husband still have sexual relations with you? Up until a year ago. What happened a year ago to change the situation? I came upon him with that girl. Mademoiselle Vague? Yes. In the office? It was so sordid. And after that, you shut your door to him? Did he ever try to come in? Only once. I told him what my reasons were, and he understood. Didn't he insist? He didn't even apologize. He went away, just like someone who has gotten off at the wrong floor. Have you had any lovers? What? I'm asking you if you've had any lovers. These things happen, don't they? Not in our family, Chief Inspector. And if my father were here, I... In his capacity as judge, your father would understand that it is my duty to ask you the question. You've just spoken to me of an atmosphere of fear, of threat hanging over you and your husband. You suggest, in veiled terms, that I should have him examined by a psychiatrist, so it is natural. Uh, forgive me. I let myself get carried away. No, I have not had any lovers, and I never shall have. Do you have a gun? Yes, this drawer. Be careful, it's loaded. Have you had it long? One of my friends, a woman with a really black sense of humor, gave it to me when I got married. Aren't you afraid that the children playing around... No, they rarely come into my rooms, and when they were younger, this gun was kept under lock and key. And your shotguns? They're in a case, and that case is in the coach house, without trunks, suitcases, and golf bags. Oh, does your husband play golf? <laughs> I've tried to get him interested, but he gets out of breath by the third hole. Is he often ill? He has few serious illnesses. The worst, if I remember rightly, was an attack of pleurisy. 
On the other hand, he's constantly affected by little things. Laryngitis, influenza, head colds. Does he call his doctor? Of course. One of your friends? No, a doctor from nearby. Dr. Martin, who lives on the Rue de Cirque, the street behind this one. Has Dr. Martin ever spoken to you privately? No, he hasn't, but I've often waited to catch him as he left to make sure that my husband had nothing serious. What did he say? He said no. That men like him often live the longest. He told me about Voltaire, who... I know about Voltaire. Has he ever suggested that your husband consult a specialist? No. Only... Only what? What's the use? You'll only misinterpret my words again. I'll try anyway. I can tell from your attitude that my husband has made an excellent impression on you, and, oh, I was sure that that would be the case. I won't say that he plays the part consciously. With strangers, he's a lively man, making a great show of stability. With Dr. Martin, he speaks and acts as he does with you. Do you want me to send an inspector to keep permanent watch on the apartment? <laughs> the idea is quite ridiculous. Not if I'm to believe your premonitions. It's not a question of premonitions. It's not a question of facts, either. Not yet. Let's go over it again. For some time, your husband has been showing signs of mental derangement. That's it, exactly. He withdraws into himself, and his behavior worries you. That is nearer the truth. You are afraid for his life, or for yours. I admit that. Which one do you think it will be? If I knew that, I would be slightly less worried. Someone living in this house, or someone who has easy access to it, sent us at the key two letters announcing that a murder would take place shortly. I may add now that there's been also a telephone call in my absence. Why didn't you tell me about it? Because I was listening to you. This message, a very brief one, only confirms the ones that preceded it. The unknown man or woman said, more or less, tell Chief Inspector Megre it will be soon. Ah. Do you still not want me to send you someone? What good would that do? What do you mean? If something is going to happen, the presence of a policeman who will be stationed heaven knows where won't stop it. Do you know that your husband has an automatic? Yes. Does he know that you have this revolver? Of course. And your children? My children have nothing to do with this. Can't you understand that? They mind their own business and not ours. They have their own lives to live. You may go now. Forgive me for not showing you out. I don't know what I expected. Whatever is going to happen, let it happen. Go and see my husband, or that girl. Goodbye, Monsieur Maigret. Do you want to see Monsieur Parandor? Um, no. That's just as well, because he's in conference with two important clients. One has come from Amsterdam, and the other from Athens. They're both ship owners. You look tired. I've spent an hour with Madame Parandor. I know. Did you put through her call to the Quai des Arfèvres? No, I didn't even know she'd phoned. It was Lise who told me when she came in and asked me for a stamp. Who's Lise? Her maid. I mean, what kind of a person is she? An ordinary girl, like me. We're both from the country. I'm from a small town, and she's from a farm. Since I had some education, I became a secretary. And since she hadn't, she became a maid. How old is she? Twenty-three. Is she a devoted servant? She does what she's told to do, very conscientiously. I don't think she's any desire to change her job. Is she intelligent enough to have written the anonymous letters? Certainly not. Did you know that Madame Parandon came upon you with her husband about a year ago? I told you that it happened once, but there have been other times when she could have opened and shut the door again without being heard. Has Parandon told you that his wife has refused to have sexual relations with him since then? They were infrequent anyway. Huh? Why? Because he doesn't love her. Doesn't love her or doesn't love her any longer? Well, that depends on what you mean by the word love. He was no doubt flattered that she married him, and for years he forced himself to show his gratitude. Won't you sit down? I think I'll have a look next door. You'll only find Julien Beau there. Tortue's in court. Well, then, Julien Beau. Patron, this one came by express mail, and it's written in a feverish sort of haste. Mm, same block letters, same envelope, same paper. Um, read it to me, Le Point. Uh, dear Chief Inspector... When I wrote my first letter and asked you to give me your answer by means of an advertisement, I could not have imagined that you would charge headfirst into this case, about which I had hoped later to give you indispensable details. Your haste has spoiled everything, and now you yourself must realize that you are all at sea. Mm. Today you have provoked the murderer in some way, and I am sure that he will feel obliged to strike because of you. 
I may be wrong, but I believe it will be some time in the next few hours. I cannot help you. I am sorry. I do not hold it against you. Looks as if things are heating up. What are these people like? Like everybody else. And like no one at all. Are you free tonight, Lapointe? I haven't anything special on. Well, then you'll go. You'll find the concierge in the lodge, a man called Lamure, who used to work on the Rue de Sauce. Spend the night in his room. Go up to the first floor from time to time. Get Lemur to give you a list of all the people living in the building, including the staff, and check all the points of entry. I see. Oh, what do you see? Well, that this way, if anything happens, we'll at least have something to work on. And if nothing happens, I'll look like a fool. I'm the man who has wasted the taxpayers' money. Good night. See you tomorrow. And someone will relieve you at about 8 in the morning. Migray, yes? Is, uh, is that you, Petro? Yes, it's me. Well, who is it? The young secretary. Dead? Unfortunately. Shot? No. There was no noise. No one noticed anything. The doctor hasn't got here yet. I'm calling you before I have any details because I was downstairs when it happened. Metro Parandon is here beside me. He's quite shattered. We're waiting for Dr. Martin to arrive. Or she stabbed? More like butchered. Well, I'll phone Murs in the lab and I'll also call the public prosecutor's office myself. I'll be right over. I'm overcome. As if it were someone in my own family. Of all the members of the household, Mademoiselle Vague is the last I would have thought of as the victim. I'd taken a liking to her. I liked the way she spoke of her relationship with Perondo, mixture of jauntiness and matter-of-factness. I sensed that at the bottom, in spite of the difference in ages, she felt for him a passionate loyalty, which is perhaps one of the truest kinds of love. Then why was she the one to be killed? Who found her? Young Julien Beau. Where is he? In the office at the end of the corridor with Perondon's assistant, uh, Maitre Tortu. I'll go and see him. Was it you who found her? Yes, sir. Did you hear anything? Did she cry out? Did she groan? Nothing. Excuse me. Hmm. It's the first time. I... Just a minute, please. I'm sorry. She was wearing an almond green spring dress, probably for the first time this season. After the blow, she must have slid out of her chair, and her body was doubled over, oddly twisted. Her throat was gaping open, and she'd lost a considerable quantity of blood, which was still warm. Please forgive me. I can't help it. She came in here about ten past nine to bring me some documents to check. Incidentally, I can't remember where I put them. It's the proceedings of yesterday's session with, with notes and references. I must have left them in their office. No. Oh, they're on my table. She asked me to take them back as soon as I had finished. I went in and... Uh, at what time? I, I don't know. I, I must have worked for about a half an hour. I was very happy, very pleased with life. I like working for her. I looked around. I didn't see her. Then... When I looked down... Uh, was she still breathing? No. The uh, men from the public prosecutor's office are here, uh, In a minute, Lapointe. Didn't you hear anything either, Maitre Tortu? No, nothing. Were you in here all the time? No. I went to see Maitre Perondeau for about ten minutes about the case I dealt with in court yesterday. What time was that? Uh, I didn't look at my watch. About 9.30. How was he? Same as usual. Was he alone? Mademoiselle Vague was with him. Did she go out as soon as you came in? A few seconds later. Hmm. Who, who told you, Le Point? Uh, the butler, Ferdinand. He knew I was downstairs. I'd spoken to him. Uh, Dr. Martin is in with the body now. Uh, okay. Let's go. Uh, Chief Inspector McRae. Uh, Dr. Martin. Doctor? I'm sorry to have got here so late, but I had a patient in my office, and she took so long to get dressed. Mm. Well, uh, she's dead, of course. Did she die uh, 
instantly? Oh, she must have lived for a few seconds, let's say 30 or 40 seconds. Since her throat was cut, she couldn't possibly have cried out. It was possibly done with this uh, erasing knife. Would you uh, would you close her eyes, Dr. Martin? Uh, the uh, photographer, Patron? Oh, of course. Uh, no, don't do anything, Doctor. I wonder if I shouldn't go and see Monsieur Paradon. Uh, do you know where he is? In his office, I imagine. Does he know? Uh, uh, has he seen... Probably. What do you think I should do? Go and see him if you think he might need you. Uh, will you leave word with La Pointe where I can reach you? Uh, yes, of course. La Pointe, uh, you better see to her parents. Their address must be in her office. Look in her purse, too. Yes. Anyway, do what has to be done. Then uh, draw me a plan of the apartment. Question everyone in it. Note down where each person was between 9.15 and 10. And take down everything everybody saw. Everyone who went out and in. Yes. Oh, uh, Ferdinand, uh, yeah. come here for a moment. You'll help LaPointe with the floor plan. Uh, Tell me, Ferdinand, I suppose Madame Parandon is in her room? Uh, yes, uh, Monsieur Maigret. How did she react? Uh, she didn't react at all, sir, because she doesn't know anything about it yet. As far as I know, she's sleeping, and Lise hasn't dared to take it on herself to wake her. Hasn't Maitre Perendon gone to see her either? Uh, monsieur hasn't left his office. Hasn't he seen the body? Uh, oh, excuse me. He, he did leave it for a minute when Maitre Tortu went to tell him. He took a quick look into Mademoiselle Vargue's office and then went back to his own. Mm, thank you. Hey, Le Point, come here to the window for a moment. Yes, See there, that uh, six-story apartment house on the Rue de Cirque. Mm -hmm. Have a couple of men question the tenants whose windows look out on this side. They, they might have seen someone through the drawing room here between 9.30 and 9.45. They must also be able to look into the other rooms. Are you going to arrest my father? Are you Maigret? Whom are you going to arrest? No one, no one at the moment. Calm down, Gus. Anyway, I can swear it wasn't my father. Weren't you half expecting it? If me was I expecting someone to, to cut Antoinette's throat, no. Well, did you call her Antoinette? I've called her that for a long time. We were good friends. Are you uh, 15, Gus? I'll be 16 in June. Did you like Mademoiselle Vague? I've told you already. She's my friend. Did you often go into her office? At least once a day. Did you ever go out with her? Go out where? To the movies, maybe, or dancing? I don't dance. I've never been out with did her. Did you ever go to her apartment? What are you trying to make me say? What are you thinking? Do you know of Antoinette's relationship with your father? Why not? Do you see anything wrong with that? It doesn't matter what I think, but what you think. My father is a free agent, isn't he? What about your mother? It wasn't any of her business. Do you think that's the reason for what happened this morning? I don't know. Were you expecting something to happen? I was expecting it and, and not expecting it. Please express yourself more clearly. Your teachers at the Lycée Racine would not accept that for an answer. I don't think you like me. That you suspect me of something. I don't know what... What? That's right. Not of having killed Antoinette. I was at school. I know. And I also know that you really worship your father. Is that wrong? Not at all. At the same time, you feel he's defenseless. What are you insinuating? Nothing bad. Your father's inclined not to fight, except in his work... He believes that everything that happens to him happens only because of his own shortcomings. He's an intelligent and honest man. Antoinette was defenseless, too, in her own way. In fact, there were two of you keeping guard over your father, she and you. That's why there was a sort of complicity between you. We never said anything about that. I'm sure you didn't. But you still felt you were on the same side. That's why, even if you had nothing to say to her, you never missed the chance of going to see her. What are you getting at? I'm there already. It was you who sent me those letters, Gus. And you who telephoned to the judicial police yesterday. Yes, it was me. But how did you come to suspect me? The letters could only have been written by the murderer or by someone who was trying to protect your father indirectly. It could have been Antoinette. Well, she wasn't a child anymore and would not have gone about things in such a complicated or childish way. I was expecting you. I know, Madame Parenton. Well, now I'm here. Why did you have to see everyone else before me? What if it was to give you time to think things over? I don't need to think things over. To think what things over? Things that have happened. The things that are inevitably going to happen. What are you talking about? 
When a murder has been committed, it is followed sooner or later by an arrest, a preliminary hearing, a trial. What has that got to do with me? You hated Antoinette, didn't you? So you call her by her Christian name, too. Who else does? <laughs> I don't know about my husband. He's probably capable of saying mademoiselle very politely while making love. How did you learn of the murder? When I awoke, I rang for Lise. She brought me my breakfast tray. It, it wasn't until she opened the curtains that I saw her eyes were all red. I asked her why she'd been crying. She burst into tears again and told me that something dreadful had happened, and I at once thought of my husband. Oh. What did you think might have happened to him? Do you think that that man is strong? Don't you think that his heart might give out at any moment? When I learned the truth, I was shattered. What's going to happen to him? To whom? To my husband. You aren't going to throw him in prison. With his health... Why should I want to put your husband in prison? In the first place, it's not my job with the judges. Furthermore, I don't see any reason at this moment for arresting your husband. Well, whom do you suspect, then? Why, Madame Parenton, would your husband have killed his secretary? Well, must there have been a reason? One doesn't usually commit murder without a motive. Uh, for example, if she were pregnant... Oh, you forget that we no longer live in the times when unmarried mothers are looked down upon. Well, I only use that as an example. Think of another reason. She might have been blackmailing him. Why? Are your husband's business affairs shady? Do you believe he's capable of serious irregularities? Oh, certainly not. In that case, I can see no reason for blackmail. Perhaps he was growing tired of a make-believe love. Why make-believe? Because of his age, his background, everything. Is your love more real? I gave him two children. You mean you gave them to him as a wedding present? Are you daring to insult me? I have no such intention, madame, but it usually takes two people to make children. Let us say more simply that you and your husband had two children. Do you think my husband is innocent? I don't think anyone is innocent a priori, just as I don't think anyone is guilty. I'm waiting for your other questions, if you have any more now to listen ask. Listen to me, madame. Contrary to what you may think, I'm not your enemy. I'm only a civil servant whose job is to look for the truth with the means at his disposal. I'm going to ask you a question. And I must ask you to think before you answer to weigh the pros and cons. I must warn you that if it is later proved that you have lied to me, I shall draw my own conclusions and I shall ask for a warrant for your arrest. Did you leave your rooms after nine o'clock this morning? And did you go in the direction of the offices for any reason whatsoever? No. You did not go through the drawing room? No. You did not go into Mademoiselle Vague's office? No. I may add that I consider these questions an insult. It's my duty to ask them. You forget that my father is still alive and... Is that a threat? I'm simply reminding you that you are not in your office at the Quai des Orfèvres. Would you rather I took you there? I dare you to. Do you deny having killed Mademoiselle Vague? You know perfectly well. What do I know? That my poor husband killed her. I have another question to ask you. Have you handled your revolver since yesterday evening? Why should I handle it? It's months. It's, uh, well, it's a long time since I tidied up that drawer. You handled it yesterday when you showed it to me. Uh, I had forgotten that. But since I handled it, my fingerprints will be on top of the others. Is that all you have found out? Come in. Uh, one of the gentlemen wishes to speak to Chief Inspector Maygray. Oh, where is he? Uh, here in the hall. He told me it was extremely urgent, and so I took the liberty of bringing... Now, will you excuse me, Madame Parenteau? What is it, La Pointe? She went through the drawing room twice this morning. Are you sure? You can't see it from here, but from the drawing room you can quite clearly. There's an invalid who sits almost all day at one of the windows on the Rue de Cirque. A very old man? No, he's about 50. He's... Uh, interested in everything that goes on in this house. Uh, judging by his replies to the other questions I asked him, we can believe what he says. What time did he see her first? Shortly after 9.30. Was she going towards the offices? Yes. Uh, he's more familiar than we are with the layout of the place. That's how he knows about Pandon and his secretary. What was she wearing? A blue housecoat. Hmm. And the second time? She went through the room in the opposite direction less than five minutes later. One detail struck him. The maid was dusting at the far end of the room, and Madame Parandon didn't see her. Have you questioned Lise? Yes, this morning. Didn't she mention the incident? She says she didn't see anything. Ah. Uh, thank you, Lapointe. Would you be so good as to ring for your maid, Madame? Do you need something? Yes. 
As you wish. If the person charged with the commission of a felony or a misdemeanor was then insane or acted by absolute necessity, no offense has been committed. Article 64. Did you ring, madame? Close the door, Lise. Shortly after 9.30, let's say at 9.35, you were dusting in the drawing room. Is that right? Yes, it's true. So you didn't see Madame Parandon going in the direction of the offices? No. But shortly after you got there, when you were at the far end of the room, you saw her going in the opposite direction. That is to say, going towards these rooms. What should I do, Madame? That is your affair, my child. Answer the question put to you. Did someone tell you something? Answer the question, as Madame has just advised you. Will it mean that Madame is arrested? It will confirm another witness's statement. Someone who lives in the Rue de Cirque and who saw both of you from his window. Oh. Well, there's no point in lying. It's true. I'm sorry, Madame. If the chief inspector has finished with you, you may go. Has she confessed? I think you will have one more occasion to study Article 64, Mr. Parandon. She possibly intended to shoot her, then changed her mind and clubbed her with the gun, and the erasing knife was lying there on the table. Do you, do you want to see her? What could I say to her? Are you taking her away? Well, in order to avoid the reporters and to give her departure some dignity, she will go in her own car. I've given instructions to the chauffeur. We shall arrive at police headquarters at the same time. May Gray Hesitates by Frederick Spurling. Produced from Toronto by Peter Duncan. Starring Bud Knapp as the Chief Inspector. Sandra Scott was featured as Madame Paranon. The other performers, Jack Anthony, Jarrow Dick, Martin Gorman, Corrine Langston, Frank Perry, Drew Russell, and John Scott. Musical decor and theme by Lucio Agostini. Sound effects, Bill Robinson. The program was recorded by Derek Stubbs. Sai Strange speaking. <laughs>